Thank you so much, musicians, and thank you, children, for that uh, wonderful story. And thank you, Emea, for reading for us. It was a cloudy, rainy, overcast Tuesday. Drizzle misting down. And Captain Lee wandered out onto the tarmac. With him were his wife and five children. They had been running for the last few weeks and there was great concern for their safety. Captain Lee inspected the fuel tanks and saw that he had uh, filled the fuel tanks to capacity. He would have about four hours of fuel. He looked into the expectant wife, uh, eyes of his wife and realized that this was the do or die moment. The O-1 bird dog is a very small airplane. You can see an example on the screen and it only has two seats. Captain Lee and his wife carefully hopped into the aircraft, seven people into a two-seat aeroplane. Would this mission work? The Viet Cong had been chasing them and they realized that if they were not to have success in this flight, there would be no plan B. There would be no other options. Despite the great risks, Captain Lee knew that he must succeed. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, God of the universe, commander of the greatest war room, we stand in awe of your presence. The thunder and lightning, the sound of many melodious waters rippling as you speak, the wheels within the wheels, the eyes, the creatures, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Lord, we come before your throne today as children. We come before you with weaknesses, with brokenness, and we ask for your divine guidance today. Please give us a glimpse into your face. Help us to see your character and reflect it in the war zone in which we live. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. It's going to start out a bit cryptic this morning, but I trust that the threads will come together very clearly as we come to the end. I have a question for us each to ponder. Are you, am I, are we a stroke of divine genius? Let's have a look at God's war room babies. I've got some pictures that you might be interested in. It just so happens today that uh, the date is December 7, 2019. For those of you that are into history or remember significant dates in history, today is a significant date for people that uh, follow the major events of the past. 78 years ago, there was a major battle that was going on, and it was joined by two more nations on December 7, 1941, at the Battle of Pearl Harbor. I want to show you a couple of pictures of a war room, in case you're not sure what a war room is. A war room is a place where important generals and leaders make big decisions about what they're going to do. This particular picture is a photograph of Sir Winston Churchill's war room. It's underground, safe from the bombs of the enemy. And if you look at the picture, it's probably hard to see, but there's a whole bunch of telephones. This is in the good old days before we had wireless telephones. I think there's about seven or eight telephones, all different colors, hardwired in to each of the, uh, the key command centers so that Churchill could give his directions. A war room is where decisions are made and strategies are formed. Here's another war room. This is September 11, 2001. And this is President, uh, well, Vice President Cheney 
and his team discussing how to handle the uh, events of September 11. Meanwhile, uh, George Bush himself thought it was too dangerous to be in the war room on the ground, so he hopped into Air Force One, and this is a photo inside the aeroplane of the uh, war room aboard uh, Air Force One. I had the privilege last week of going aboard uh, USS Midway. USS Midway is a US aircraft carrier, and our story this morning in part will feature the war room of this particular vessel. Here's a picture inside the war room of USS Midway, and on the wall there you see a map of Baghdad. The USS Midway was involved in uh, the, the first day strikes during the uh, Operation Desert Storm in 2001, sorry, 1991. If you have your Bibles handy this morning, we're going to move in and out of the story of Lee, but there's an even more important story that's going on in the Bible. And if you'll turn with me to Revelation chapter 12, we're going to continue on with the thought that Amaya shared with us just a few moments ago. Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. Now, war arose in heaven, of all places. Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. What does that make you think of? What's going on here? Where is this war taking place? Who is fighting who? As I contemplated this, it struck me that this isn't just a war being planned in a war room somewhere. This is actually a war inside the war room. This is the place where the generals are meeting and the generals themselves are divided. There is a war in heaven. The seat of governance for the universe is itself facing internal warfare. God is being accused of being an unsuitable ruler for the universe and the enemy is saying that maybe there should be someone else taking the place of God. God is the giver of life, don't forget. So if God is being threatened here, every single living creature in the universe would also be involved in this struggle. What would God do? What's God's strategy? What's God's plan to deal with this mutiny in the throne of heaven itself. What would you do if you were in God's shoes? What is God going to do? That's the question. Let's just keep reading a few more verses down. Let's look at the verse 7 again and read down to verse 10. Now, war arose in heaven. We just read, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought back, but he, that's the dragon, was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan. The deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown down to earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. What's God going to do? What's going to be the strategy? If you were God and had this kind of a challenge on your hands, what would you do? Would you call in USS Midway, a couple of nuclear missiles perhaps? What would be a good strategy to eradicate um, a contender for the throne? I'd like to have a look this morning at the continuation of this battle, and it's going to appear throughout the Bible this morning, we're going to have a look at a couple of snapshot examples, and maybe in your time this afternoon or through the week, you might want to look more carefully. But let's have a look at Exodus chapter 1 and see what God does subsequent to this war in heaven. What's happening 
to God's people subsequent to this war in heaven. Exodus chapter 1. We're going to be flipping backwards and forwards between Exodus and the story of Jesus this morning, so it wouldn't hurt. I kind of got some posty notes and put them in there, or if you've got a little um, bulletin insert or a piece of paper or a finger, keep yourself uh, referencing to Exodus 1 and 2, because we'll come back to this. Exodus chapter 1. Exodus chapter 1, uh, verses 8, 11, and 22. God and his people, the dragon and his people. Exodus chapter 1, verse 8. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. Verse 9. He said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, therefore, let us deal shrewdly with them lest they multiply, and if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, verse 11, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities, Pithom and Ramesses. And I'm going to sneak down to verse 22. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every son that is born to the Hebrews, you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. My question here is, what's, what's the problem? What are the struggles? What are the difficulties that God's people are facing? What kind of characteristics from verses 8 to 11 are God's people having to contend with? What are the challenges that God's people are facing in uh, Exodus 1, verses 8 to 11. Does anything jump out at you there? Any ideas? What's happening in Exodus chapter 1, verses 8 to 11? What are the difficulties that God's people are experiencing? It's not a trick question. It should be an easy one. Say again? A hostile government. Thank you very much. What else? Genocide. What else? Anything else? Strike? Those, those are two pretty bad things, aren't they? Anything else, or is that pretty much the story, do you think? Exodus chapter 1, verses 8 to 11. How about the dealing shrewdly with God's people bit? Manipulation. Uh, maybe some crooked dealings to take advantage of people who can't look after themselves. A king of Egypt who didn't know Joseph. There's the crooked government dealing shrewdly. And being afflicted with heavy burdens. These people aren't just able to make their own choices. They are being held under thumb. And of course, um, uh, the genocide issue there from my friend Kent. This is not a very happy place for God's people. What's God's strategy, do you think? What's God's solution to genocide, to a corrupt government, to people who deal shrewdly and afflict other people with heavy burdens. What's, what's God's solution to this problem, do you think? The children's story brought it out very nicely this morning. God says, I know what I'll do. I'm going to send a baby. What a good idea. I'll send a child to go and sort the adults out. I find this to be very interesting. God knows the future before it happens. He tells Moses many years later, I've heard the cry of my people coming up to me. Exodus 3 verse 7 and 9, I think it was from memory. And so God says, I'm going to send a baby to take care of the people who are killing babies. I'm going to send a new government system to go and sort out the corrupt government system. I'm going to use a group of people with no soldiers to deal with the greatest fighting force the world currently has to offer. What a creative strategy. Maybe it's even a stroke of genius strategy. God won't stop at anything to save us, even if it means using a baby. Let's just come back to Captain Lee. 
The Bird Dog is a very simple, very small aeroplane, but it was painted in the US uh, Air Force paint scheme, a little observation aeroplane. Lee completed his magneto check, ran the engine to full power, and took off. He only had 220-odd horsepower and divided among seven people in an aeroplane and four hours of fuel. There's not much left to actually accelerate. The aircraft did get airborne, and Lee circled the field to try and get some altitude before he headed out across to the ocean. This is before the days of really uh, GPS navigation, and in the area, he was uh, surrounded by anti-aircraft guns that were trained at his aircraft. And as he maneuvered the aircraft, they could sense the tension. It was palpable. The wife and kids are wondering, are we going to get out of this alive? Lee very thankfully did make it past the guns and headed out towards open sea. But what would he head for? What's going to be a good landing area in the middle of an open sea? This is not a seaplane, as you can see. He did not have uh, life jackets for all of his children. And he's thinking, there's two adults and five kids. Hopefully I can find a friendly ship somewhere. Maybe I can circle the ship and, and uh, make a splash landing. Maybe something will work out. But the, uh, the tension was very, very definitely thick. Anything, though, would be better than being caught by the Viet Cong. For Captain Lee was a ranking officer. We'll come back to Captain Lee, but I want to have a look at another baby from God's war room. This also was alluded to with the children's story this morning. Let's have a look at 1 Samuel chapter 2. You may want to keep your fingers or maybe a piece of paper in Exodus 1 and 2, but let's sneak over to 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 12 to 17. How bad can it get for God's people, do you think? It's not a rhetorical question. How bad can it get for God's people? 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 12 to 17. Let me share this verse with you, and I'd encourage you to follow along with me. I'm reading from the ESV, but you're welcome to follow along in whatever version you have 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 12 to 17. Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. The custom of the priests with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servant would come while the meat was boiling with a three-pronged fork in his hand, and he would thrust it into the pan or the kettle or the cauldron or the pot. All that the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. This is what they did at Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. Moreover, verse 15, before the fat was burned, this is very naughty, by the way, the priest's servant would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, give meat for the priests to roast, for he will not accept boiled meat from you, but only raw and if the man said to him, let them burn the fat first and then take as much as you wish, the servant would reply, no, you must give it now. And if not, I will take it by force. Thus, the sin of the young men was very great in the sight of the Lord. For the men treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. Who are these boys we're talking about here. What is their job description? What is their lineage? What's their work? They're the, son they're the sons of the priest, the high priest. Very good. Thank you. And these people are not only being naughty behind closed doors, they're being naughty at church, right? They're taking offering from the people that belongs to God and putting it in their own pockets. Now, that might seem pretty bad, but it doesn't finish there, unfortunately. Let's continue on. Or we'll just uh, have a look at the, the issues here. The worthless men, they did not know God. Now, this obviously isn't a lack of knowledge about God, but it's a lack of intimacy with God, a lack of willingness to be connected with God. 
They were selfish, taking what belonged to God. It's like skimming the tithe, if you like. And they were willing to use force to get their way. What an example from the, the uh, sons of the chief priest. They were acting, by the way, in an official capacity. So it wasn't just the sons. It was, if you like, the, the priests themselves who were, who were doing this. They treated God's law with contempt. Sneaking on down to verse 22, same chapter, 1 Samuel 2, verse 22 to 25. Now, Eli was very old. He kept hearing all that his sons were doing to all Israel and how they were sleeping with the woman who were serving at the entrance of the tent of meeting. In other words, at the, at the tabernacle. He said to them, why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all these people people. No, my sons, it is no good report that I hear of the people of the Lord spreading abroad. If someone sins against a man, God will mediate for him. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? But they would not listen to the voice of their father. And it goes on to mention uh, some, some big challenges there. These priests are not only stealing tithes, but they're doing very inappropriate things with the ladies at the door of the tabernacle, at the temple of God. The house of God is being turned into a cheap place, and there's not respect happening for God or God's uh, law, God's governance. The whole people of Israel are talking about this. Look at these points. There's interference happening. The people are complaining about this to Eli. There's gossip about the scandals being circulated, and there's an unwillingness for the children to listen, and maybe even an unwillingness from the father to eject his own sons. Shouldn't Eli just tell the sons, look, you're out of here, this isn't appropriate? But no, the father seems to be at least tacitly allowing the sons to continue. My question is, what does God do about this? What's God's strategy here? You know, I hear people complain today about how there's apostasy in the church or people are doing wrong things. We need to go and straighten people out. How did God straighten people out here? This is pretty terrible stuff. I think you'd agree with me. This is probably as bad as it gets. What did God do here to straighten things out? He sent a child before he sent a child. Look at uh, 2 verse 27. <clears throat> God did something else first. Samuel, 1 Samuel 2, verse 27. God sent a messenger of God to Eli and warned him. But Eli didn't listen. And then God sent the child. So, yes, God did send a child as a last resort after trying all these other methods to get into Eli, Eli's uh, thick head. God, knowing the future, raised a child from the line of the priests. It's a bit of an interesting genealogy if you're interested, but Samuel actually comes from the relatives of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. If you look at the genealogy, very interesting. God used a descendant of some people who had made bad choices to make things right with uh, the priests of Samuel's day. God seems to use babies in his war room to engineer some stunning uh, results. Maybe perhaps God is using a devoke of divine genius for something pretty special. As Lee circled out to sea, he was looking for some place to set down. And after quite some time, Captain Lee and his little bird dog, his wife and five kids circled over a big aircraft carrier ship, which happens to be the USS Midway. And Captain Lee was thinking, aha, fuel, big sigh of relief. Surely things will work out. Surely I can land on this aircraft carrier and surely my family will be saved. But Captain Lee was not on the correct radio frequency. And in this picture here, you can see Captain Lawrence Chambers, who was the commander of the ship, trying desperately to get in touch with this strange aircraft. Who is this aircraft? What is this aircraft doing here? What's the, 
What's the, is, we're in a war zone, maybe this is part of an enemy ploy. It's a, it's a funny airplane to be heading out to an aircraft carrier. And so uh, the uh, Captain Lawrence Chambers tried unsuccessfully to make contact. And then he said, right, if they're not going to listen, let's fire flares at the airplane and into the water and indicate to him he's not welcome here. So they did. They fired flares. I think it was orange color from memory. A warning shots. Get out of here. Lee was desperate and didn't want to, uh, he had nowhere else to go. So he continued to circle the aircraft and made an attempt to make an approach and landing. Captain Chambers said, we're not going to let this guy on our deck and began to zigzag the aircraft carrier so that as the bird dog came on final approach, the aircraft would turn and throw Captain Lee off his landing. It was really tense and people were wondering what's going to happen. Captain Lee and his wife and kids were desperately anxious. Please, please let us land. Give us safety. Give us a place to rest. I want to look more carefully at God's war room babies and just point out some interesting uh, parallels that I found out as I was looking at these passages. We've been in Exodus and we're going to now turn to the book of Matthew. I'd like you to turn back to Exodus uh, 1 and 2, but also turn with me to the uh, New Testament. And um, I have some passages here from Matthew and some from Luke. We'll just uh, figure out, I think we have a Luke passage first. We're going to be looking at baby Jesus this morning. Obviously, we're coming up on a time for Christmas, and we talk a lot about this Christ, this Messiah child. In Exodus chapter 3 and in Luke chapter 2, I'd like to point out something very interesting that you may have already seen before. Maybe you haven't. If you have a look at Exodus chapter 3, verse 7 to 9, you'll notice that God's people are facing great oppression because of a foreign, unfriendly power. In Exodus chapter 3, that power is Egypt. What is the oppressive power in the time of the birth of Jesus? It's a, obviously, it's Rome, and there's some uh, references up there we can look at. We also have a death edict in Exodus chapter 1, verse 22. Who is being targeted in Exodus chapter 1, verse 22? It's all the boys, isn't it? Does that sound familiar to the birth of Jesus? Who's being targeted when Jesus is being born? If we have a look at um, Luke chapter 2, we see that there is an edict also for all the boys when Jesus is born, as if there's some sort of a parallel or a, or a type going on here. Exodus chapter 2, verse 9. As Moses was rescued from the bulrushes, there's an obviously a practical consideration. Who's going to pay for? How is Moses going to be supported? Where did Moses get his sustentation from? Who financed the raising of baby Moses? Pharaoh's daughter. So it's a foreigner. It's the Egyptian uh, princess, if you like, that financed the raising of baby Moses. Who financed the raising of baby Jesus? The, the wise men, once again, some foreigners. I found it interesting. Jesus was, sorry, Moses was raised in Egypt, uh, Exodus 2, verse 1 to 5. And we see also that um, in addition to Moses being raised in Egypt, Jesus too was raised in Egypt. And these parallels got me thinking a little bit. Is God got a plan here? Is, is God doing this intentionally? Is there a stroke of divine intentionality bordering on genius that God is using one story to help us prepare for another story. As Captain Lee continued to circle the ship, 
the, uh, the captain and the air boss began to have a discussion. You see, today was a day of radio silence. Today was not the day to be communicating between ship and shore because they were in war. This is uh, Operation Frequent Wind is in process as the story's unfolding. So the captain and the air boss had a, they conferred with each other. The air boss in the picture here, by the way, is the, is, if you like, the air traffic controller for the aircraft carrier. The captain of the ship is in charge for the safety of the ship. The air boss is in charge of how the airplanes operates to and from that ship. The air boss is in charge of the deck. As Lee circled around, he and his wife penned a note in desperation. He had a little map in his possession and he wrote on there, please let us land, move the helicopters to the side of the deck and let us land on your ship. Signed, Captain Lee, wife and five children. And P.S. we've got about an hour of fuel remaining. He put this into a pistol and dropped the pistol out the window of the bird dog. It landed on the deck of USS Midway and that note was brought up to the operations room at um, USS Midway. These men then decided, let's give this guy a landing on the aircraft carrier. However, the aircraft carrier deck was a busy place. Lots of helicopters were already going backwards and forwards. They were going, you've probably seen the videos or the, the film footage of people being rescued out of Hanoi. Um, the helicopters would come back to the aircraft carrier, unload refugees, they'd be out of fuel. It'd be faster to get another helicopter and just dispatch that one and leave the first helicopter unfueled on the deck and I'd get back to it later. But there's no room on the deck for this bird dog to land. This bird dog is not designed to land on aircraft carriers. It doesn't have an arrestor hook, for example. So the air boss had to make some tough decisions and he said to his men, clear the decks. I don't care what it costs, clear the decks. And so one by one, and if you look at these photos and the video footage, everybody got involved, whether they were um, deckhands, whether they were refuelers, armament, engineers, pilots, uh, the firemen, the refuelers, everybody got together and literally pushed fully serviceable helicopters over the side of the ship. Nothing wrong with them except they're out of fuel. They pushed multiple helicopters over the side and made provision so that Captain Lee could land. But it's still a pitching deck. They're still out in the middle of the ocean. And this bird dog is not designed to land on an aircraft carrier. No Vietnamese pilot had ever landed on an aircraft carrier before. Today would be the first time that an attempt like this would be made. As we think about Captain Lee and his wife and five kids, I want to just look at one more war room baby. We had a look at Moses and Jesus. Let's have a quick look at Samuel and some parallels with the birth of Jesus as well. Like Moses, I find the similarities here very interesting. In the time of Samuel, who was it that was oppressing God's people? Uh, yeah, the Philistines were oppressing God's people, but we read the passage about the sons taking the, the, the stuff from the people and also sleeping with the people in front of the church. The people themselves were complaining to God, to Moses, and the gossip was around, hey, it's the guys at church that are giving us a hard time. Yes, the Philistines are in the background somewhere, but at God's house, that's where the problem is. <laughs> God's religious leaders we're oppressing God's people. Is that at all similar to how it was in the time of Jesus? Yes, Rome is in the background. Yes, Rome is persecuting God's people. But was Rome the only perpetrator of injustice towards God's people? <laughs> how about the religious leaders themselves? And I've got a passage there, 11 verse 46. The people are quite happy to stone uh, Jesus and Lazarus to death because they don't fit in with their desires and constraints. There's massive depravity in the time of Samuel, and I'm sorry to say it didn't look any better in the time of Jesus. Matthew, uh, sorry, the mother 
of Samuel was unable to conceive. It was a, there was a divine answer to prayer that Samuel was conceived. And in, in Mary's case, um, she also, barring a miracle, um, had not yet married, so she too was not in a position to be conceiving. And both of these mothers gave birth to people outside human logic, outside the normal ability of the birthing process. Interestingly, after Samuel's mum gave birth, she sang a song of praise to God. She said, my soul exalts the Lord for he has done all these things. And she lists all of the wonderful things that God does in, in uh, 1 Samuel 2 verse 1 to 10. Does that ring a bell? Did someone else sing a song after she gave birth to a child as well? We have uh, Mary's song of praise. We call it the Magnificat in Luke chapter 1. And these two songs of praise have a lot in common. The mum of Samuel and the mum of Jesus almost appear like they've, they've, uh, they've colluded or something. <laughs> like they got together and decided this generations apart from each other. We also have this idea that Samuel was taken to the temple dedicated to the service of God for a purpose for the nation of Israel. And I, I find it very similar to Jesus also being taken to the temple, dedicated to the work of God for the salvation of his people. Interestingly, in the book of Samuel, it says that, this is Samuel chapter 1, sorry, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 26, it says that Samuel grew. How did Samuel grow? 1 Samuel 2, verse 26. What was the, what was the key description words for Samuel's growth in 1 Samuel chapter 2? He grew in wisdom and stature and in favour with God and man. Interestingly enough, when uh, Luke writes his gospel, it's almost like Luke and the writer of Samuel copied the same manuscript. Jesus, too, grew in wisdom and in stature and in favour with God and man. Why would God do this? Why do we have these seeming parallels between uh, Moses and Jesus, between Samuel and Jesus? I'm curious about that. Just for a bit of fun, I had a look at um, the birth of Samson and the birth of John the Baptist, also as babies being called upon to do something great. And we'll just uh, look at these as we draw to a close. Once again, if you remember the story of uh, Samson, maybe you look at this this afternoon. This is from Judges chapter 13. This story, uh, Samson and his people are being oppressed by the Philistines. And that, of course, is happening um, in the time of John the Baptist and Jesus. Once again, the mother of Samson was barren. She could not conceive. And likewise, um, Elizabeth could not conceive either. An angel messenger appears to Manoah and Manoah's wife, or Manoah's wife first up and says, you're going to have a special child who's going to do some special things. Similarly, an angel messenger appears to um, Zacharias and says your wife will conceive a son and this son will do special things for your people there's a prohibition on strong drink that he is to be a Nazarite in the story of Samson and likewise a prohibition on strong drink that he too would have the lifestyle of a Nazarite Samson was to be a deliverer uh, in Judges and the child of Elizabeth was to be a forerunner filled with the Holy Spirit to announce the coming of Christ. I guess in closing today, I want to ask you to have a think with me about these stories. And there's many more that we didn't even get to today. The children's story alluded to several other stories. What about Little Maid? What about Gideon? What about uh, uh, David, Esther? There are lots of people throughout the Bible that God seems to handpick as children and sets them up as an example or a type or a, is it wrong to use the word, like a foretaste, a, a, a movie trailer 
of the real Christ trial that's about to come? Could it be that God, in each of these stories of children, is encouraging us to look to the Messiah, the Christ child, the Redeemer of the earth, who's coming in flesh to solve this battle, this war that has been raging since the beginning of time? Why would God use babies? Humans don't tend to use um, babies in the war room, those, those Churchill war rooms, the September 11 war rooms, USS Midway war rooms, none of those thought, well, we'll get a baby to solve this problem. <laughs> They're all picking the big smart guys, the guys with the weapons, the guys with the brains, the guys with the important titles and the big fancy uniforms. But God seems to use little people or perhaps people who don't have all those qualifications. I'm just wondering... Is it possible that God is choosing you and me? Is it possible that we are God's solution to the challenge that we face today, to the, to the, to the heartache and the brokenness in our world? Could it be that you are God's solution to that problem? Could it be that you and I together are God's hands to a broken, to a dying, to a dead world? I want to just turn back to Revelation chapter 12 and make my final closing appeal to you. Revelation 12 seems to be serious. It's not just a game or a movie or an old uh, kind of a, a myth narrative or a legend from some time long ago. It seems that you and I ourselves are caught up in this. If God is wiped out, we are wiped out. Our life, our existence depends upon God. This is what Revelation 12, verse 7 to 10 says. We've read it uh, at the beginning of the message this morning. War arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated. That's the dragon was defeated. There was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down. That ancient servant who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown down to earth and his angels were thrown down with him. Perhaps you feel incapable. Perhaps you feel discouraged. Perhaps the, the losses of this week or this month or this year, the discouragements, the doubts, the questions that you have or your friends have, maybe that's drawing you down. Maybe you're feeling like, I don't know how to make it with this. I'd like to leave you a promise this morning from Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. God has an ingenious solution to the challenges he faces today. He sent Jesus Christ to a manger 2,000 years ago, and he's sending us on an awesome opportunity to partner with the baby in the manger to restore the world for God's glory and for our own peace and purposes. The stable door is coming up in a week and a half. A lot of you are already involved in this, or maybe you have friends and family that you'd like to be able to participate in this. And I encourage you, as you think about your life and your activities in the next few days, how can we together work with the child in the manger to be the solution to the greatest challenge that the universe faces. Here's the promise, and I'll sit down. And they conquered the dragon by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. There's two groups here, the blood of the lamb, we know who that is, and by the word of their testimony. Who are those people? Let me encourage you, brothers and sisters, let's be the hands and feet of Christ this week. Thank you very much. Our dear Heavenly Father, God of the universe, creator and uh, redeemer of our souls, we are so in awe that you care about us so much, that you would throw everything, even the kitchen sink, literally, at uh, the human condition, sending your own son to die for us. Lord, we care about what happens to people. We care about what happens in uh, the lives of those people around us. 
we want to know what happens to people when they face challenges. And I want to thank you for looking after Major Lee and his wife, for helping them land safely on that aircraft carrier deck after great challenges. Lord, we want good endings to stories. We want to know. We want to know how it works out. And I pray that you would work out our stories today in a way that honours you, that you would look after our loved ones and our friends, maybe some of those who have strayed far from you, that we ask for the genius of the war room babies to lead us to the foot of the cross today. We thank you that we can trust you and that you will rescue us no matter the challenges. We love you and thank you. In the name of Jesus. Amen.